Hey everybody, I'm Mike Liebenson, owner of CT Local Marketing, and this is Bill DeRosa from Talking Finger. And uh, today, I hope you guys are all excited. We're going to talk about video marketing. All right, so here's here's kind of a, an overview of what we're going to cover. Why video? I'm going to dazzle you with some statistics that I'll probably make some up on the way. Um, number two, what about or what to make videos about? Kind of um, topics, keywords, stuff like that. Number three is going to be getting traffic from Google. Um, there's a difference between just putting your video on YouTube and actually there's like a science behind it, how to put the keywords in. Even things like the file name makes a difference when you go to upload it. And then producing videos on a shoestring. We're going to talk quickly about how lighting and sound can make you know, a, a, a flip camera, uh, an iPhone look good. And then that's where Bill's going to come in, number five, where we're talking about social media. So once you have the content, how do you, what's the strategy to disseminate it between Facebook, Twitter, and stuff like that? And those points is amazing. <laughs> yeah. And then if we have time, we have a bonus tip, which I think only Alex knows what that is. Even, do you remember? We'll talk fast because we want the bonus. All right, but I don't know. I don't know if you guys. <laughs> we'll come to the bonus. We we'll get the hell out of here. <laughs> More than a billion unique visitors on YouTube per month. YouTube's the number two search engine. Does anyone know what number one is? Yeah. And Google owns YouTube. So, Google likes video. So it makes sense to have YouTube as part of your strategy. Just by being on YouTube, you're going to get favored to show up in the Google results. Just by being there. So there's been a whole debate, I'll talk more about it later, about um, whether to host your videos on YouTube or like a Vimeo or there's other paid hosting sites, there's lots of them. But I think the, at least the people that I talk to, the consensus is that YouTube because Google owns it, it's as simple as that. They're the, they're the thousand pound gorilla or whatever. Um, yeah, even socially, we always push people towards YouTube more than any other site just because of the SEO rankings and also YouTube has an awesome integration with social networks, whereas Vimeo is a little more closed off, it's a little more difficult to integrate Vimeo into the social networking sphere. Although it's, Vimeo is still a good place to be, and I, I'm gonna talk about how to upload to multiple places, but. I see Vimeo showing up a lot of, in a lot of uh, general search results. Um, so, you know, video just video in and of itself. A quick thing that I realized the other day: I was sitting down in a meeting. Actually, it was a meeting that Bill brought me into. And so I had an introduction. I had it was a warm intro. So I'm at the sales. It's a you know it's a sales call. And I was sitting there at the table thinking, these people don't know me. They've never seen any of my videos. They've never been on my email list. And I realized how I've come to rely on that. Because I do, I try to practice what I preach. And I have, you know, for a while I was making a video a week. I was doing different tips and topics. So a lot of times when I'd meet with somebody, they would already know me. And I missed having that. So I'm at this sales call and I'm sitting there thinking, I have to say something profound. I have to come up with something. <laughs> Because they don't know me, so there, there's already that. Um, if you have videos on your website, or if somebody imagine somebody finds you on yeah. online, and they see you talk, and they hear you, and they bond with you, and then they call you, you're already one step ahead. So it's just, in my own experience, it's really powerful. What to make videos about? Um, where I want to focus today is not on making a commercial for your business. I think you should have that. Um, but today, I want to talk about content videos. So what do I mean by content videos? Anybody? Informational? Providing information? Right. So not, not salesy, things that, um, you know, potential topics people could search for. They're not necessarily looking to hire you, but they're looking for information like we just talked about, how to change an alternator or, or something like that. So the trick is to figure out what are relevant <laughs> topics to your business. This is my handout <clears throat> that I have everyone start with because the, the process of coming up with the, the topics, even if we were to work together, you kind of need to do this, the brainstorming on your own. So, you know, things like, what's the most, what's the stupidest question you've ever been asked? 
what's the most common question that you've ever been asked? So my suggestion would be to take out a piece of paper and just start writing these things down. And don't filter them, just, you know, just write them down and then do a, a brain dump. Um, what are some things that you hate talking about that you wish you could can in a video? Um, what are some of the questions you think people should ask or you wish they'd ask? Take a piece of paper and keep it with you in your pocket. That's what I like to do. Because the, the questions are gonna come out while you're out and about working. I think that's easier than just sitting there and saying, I'm gonna come up with a list of topics. So kind of make it a, you know, something that you take with you for a while. So once you have that, this, the second step is the keyword research. So this is kind of a, a, a scary word. Um, it sounds technical, but I'm gonna give you a really simple way to do it. It's really just a matter of, you have this whole list of possibilities. So all the different, you, you take all the topics you, wrote, topics you wrote down in step one, kind of break them up, look for specific words that might be little searchable items. You take them all and you go to what's called the Google Keyword Tool. You can just Google it, Google Keyword Tool. It's free. And you just dump all the words in there. And this is where the science comes in. It's actually gonna spit back to you all of the words and tell you <coughs> if people are searching for them or not. So Todd, is it copywriting? Right. So it might be, so maybe some possibilities are um, copywriting best practices, how to copyright, or you might want to try some more commercial things like um, copywriting professionals, copywriting professionals in Connecticut. So you come up with a list of all different possibilities that you think might work. You put them into the keyword tool. I'm pointing at the screen because that's where the computer is. <laughs> <laughs> so you pretend there's a keyword tool. It's just a box. You, you paste all the words in there and then you, you press submit and it's going to come back and it, it's going to say um, copywriting professional 20, uh, professionals Connecticut zero. I mean, whatever it's going to be. So you're going to sort through the list and say, that's, you know, this word has a lot of search volume, so it's a great potential. If you were on page one with that search term, you have all those people looking for you, you know, for this keyword. Oh, that volume is for how long a period of time? It's uh, usually per month. And even, the number doesn't even really matter. It's, it's just you want to pick the words that are higher than lower. You know, if there's zero search volume, then you probably want to stay away. Expand a little bit more on how specific a keyword is versus how general. You know, copywriting is a very general keyword search versus professional copywriter or Shelton Connecticut. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, you know, do you need to have a keyword that says all that? <coughs> would that one cover generic copywriting? Um, you know, how mm -hmm. many keywords do you need within that whole realm of, of a right. search plan? So. Did, we're not doing a, a general search engine talk today, so website SEO, search engine optimization is, is different. <laughs> when it comes to YouTube videos, we're, really, we're looking at one main keyword search term, and it's going to go in the title, and I'll talk about that a little more in a minute. So, and you also want to reduce the amount of competition, that's why you wouldn't necessarily do copywriting because you're probably going to get so many results and no matter how good your video is unless the content is incredibly um like everybody wants to see it you'll never get to the top page anyway so you kind of want to find like a middle ground between um words that you use and the competition that's out there so that you can rank higher on youtube because you also don't want to get buried you know you want to try and rise to the words that are being searched for copywriting there's probably a million people that search for it in a month so it, that's probably not the best word to use because it doesn't matter. You're never going to be found because so you're going to be buried. So if you look down and you look for more specific terms that you feel it can apply to you, those are the words that we, you would use, things like that. Mm -hmm. And they suggest yeah. other top words. Yeah, they'll like do suggestions. Put one phrase in and like five others will pop up. And those, those are good things, good, good clues too. Mm -hmm. When you search, you search your own term. Because the, the one thing that I forgot to, to include in this, that's you know, because there's, there's a whole, I spend a lot of time working on this. Like for new clients, I'll spend hours working on this before we get started in video. Um, but so one thing I didn't mention is the competition, like Bill's talking about. 
So if you find some keywords that have search traffic, you can then, when you search that actual term, you know the number that comes back, how many results there are? Typically, if you're trying to rank, uh, you're trying to get a YouTube video to show up on page one, if you can find something that has about 300,000 to a million, maybe two million results, there's a really good chance that you can get that video to show up on page one. So like, if, if, yeah, if we were gonna do copywriting and, and be general and not include a city and state, so now we're competing across the whole world. So that, you could spend thousands of dollars trying to get that one keyword. And people YouTube spend thousands of months trying to do that stuff. So. YouTube will put you on page one if you wanna pay for it. <laughs> yeah. So it comes down to. Right. <laughs> so there's, yeah, there's a, there's a lot you can do to uh, promote the videos. But for the most part, um, what I'm looking for here is you start with the relevancy. You start with what's, what are the topics that you think people would want to watch? Because that's still got to be king. Because we're going to be promoting this stuff in, in social. It's not just about search engines. But what I'm, what I'm trying to get across here is take this extra step and try to look for, I mean, it might be a matter of how you word it that makes a difference. If you find a clue that hey, this little combination has a lot of volume and it's still relevant, I can put it in there. And so now I'm going to automatically get some free traffic just by doing that. So I think, but Porter, you were asking about um, how specific I am. I'm, I'm working in local markets most of the time, so I'm always putting in a geographical word. Yeah. So that already makes it much easier. You're competing in Connecticut at the most, or Shelton, depending on what kind of business you have. Yeah, for any online online ads, the first parameter that really cuts out a tremendous amount of population and competition is geographic location. That's why storefronts, people with physical locations, whether you depend on a customer or client coming into a location, actually have an advantage over companies that provide like a nationwide service because uh, alone you're saving thousands of dollars in targeted ads just because someone from Albuquerque, New Mexico is not going to come to Connecticut. So now you're talking about a 50 mile radius, which if you think about it, cuts out a tremendous amount of money spent on ads. So. So I, I think half the battle is just knowing what words to target. Because mm -hmm. once you know, if you know Life Coach Connecticut is a word that makes you money, mm -hmm. then you can spend all kinds of money trying to get that to show up. Mm -hmm. But a, the simple trick for today is just by uploading a video. Before I talk about that, this is an example screenshot. That's not the whole screen, but this is what it looks like when the videos show up. This is a regular... Google search page, it's not a YouTube page. So in this case, I got three videos for one company showing up. My one client, I got three videos. So he's like dominating the page. Um, so that what I was talking about, when you write your, the, the title is, is the most important part of the YouTube video. So write the title before you even upload it. And on this, back on this, this workshop, or this worksheet, I got an example on uh, page two, step three. For my, you know, the way I like to set up my headlines, or my titles rather, is to put the keyword first and then put the topic of the video. So if you see on step three, I have example, video marketing Shelton slash how to do keyword research. So the, the main keyword in this case is video marketing Shelton. So that's first. And then how to do keyword research. And you only have 64 characters, so you need to, you need to keep it concise, and that's, because that's the part that's gonna show up in the, Google, the search results. So you want it, I mean, you can show up there, but if no one clicks on it, it doesn't help you. So your, your headline, your title has to be compelling, and it has to have your keyword in it. So putting the keyword in the rest of it doesn't help you Bottom line, if you don't have a keyword in the beginning, the, the left side of the title, none of this stuff I'm talking about is really going to work in terms of getting the, the free traffic. You can change the title once you've, you've done it. You can. Like, I've done things where I've um, changed it, where I put the phone number in there on the, on the latter half, so people can just see the phone number. and It works with contractors. 
-hmm. People don't want to watch the video, they just want to call. So you're basically just taking up space in the results. You're not really, you don't really care if they watch the video or not. Yeah. Um, but generally, it's not good to mess with it. If you got a video that's ranking, that's showing up. No, but I mean, if you if you just had put one in, can you change it to use these tools? Oh, like so a video that you've already had yeah. uploaded. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. If you have videos that are not, you're not getting views, they're not showing up anywhere, go back and, and edit them. Put new words in there. Keep If it's not working after like a, a month, it's not going to work. If Google recrawls constantly, <clears throat> They're always indexing over and over and over. So just by changing it sometimes even actually triggers the crawl again. It triggers that it potentially is new content that it will get crawled. I just have a question yeah. on, sure. the, on the title, the, um, the vertical bar character. Is that important as opposed to a colon or a dash or something like that? No. Okay. That's just what you were using to show two sides. Yeah. What, that stuff, I do that because I try to think about how somebody's going to look at it. So I like to delineate the, the keywords so, so they're only focusing on the topic, not the keyword. Keyword's there for Google. The topic's there for the people. Mm -hmm. So the other quick things to, to do um, besides the title, you always want to put the link to your website or whatever page you're promoting. I mean, you can link to another YouTube video. You can link to a Facebook page. Whatever you're trying to, you know, where you want to send them. Or that you're trying to create a backlink for it. If, uh, I don't want to get into that. So, <laughs> um, so the link always use, you know the full website address is like HTTP slash slash www. You need all that. If you don't start with that, it's not going to work. It's not going to be a live link. In other words, you want it to where they can click on it. Yeah, just don't put www. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Full HTTP. Yeah, what do you mean by putting the full script? I see under description. Right. Say, well, include the link, put in the full script. I like to transcribe the videos. Mm -hmm. And uh, two things I do with that. So I have a, a written transcription of what I say in the video, or whoever mm -hmm. says in the video. You can upload it into YouTube and the closed captioning. And mm -hmm. you're better off doing that because Google will guess at what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And they don't guess very well. No. Uh -huh. If anybody has Google Voice, you know what it's yeah, talking about. exactly. The transcription. We actually laugh in the office sometimes because someone will leave a voicemail and it's like, uh, I found bubblegum shoe pool <laughs> only at, and it's like, okay, this is completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, so once you have, yeah, you, you take the transcription, you put it in the closed captioning, and then what I'm saying here is actually paste it into the description. So when you put in your, when you upload a YouTube, you have the title, and then you have a description box that you put your stuff into, and that's where that's where the link you put the link first, and then you put the description, anything you want to say about the video, and then I'm saying post um, the full transcript, and of course you want to have your contact info in there too, and then the tags, the the part where you actually put in keywords. There's actually a, a keywords part of the video. That's not as important. You still want to put stuff in there, but um, just like you know, on the websites, if back in the day, you used to be able to just tell Google what keywords are important. They don't buy that anymore. So, so next, we're going to go into producing and then the social. So does anyone have a question about what we did so far? Just one quick. So with a video, do you just focus on one keyword phrase for that video, or would you try right. to do two? Uh, you've got 64 characters. Um, so generally, you do one, but with some with some companies that I that I work for um, that have they're trying to cover a lot of little cities, I'll sometimes put a couple cities in there. So, like in my example for for me, video marketing Shelton, I might do video marketing Shelton. Uh, orange derby yeah. you know as much as you get yeah, it doesn't hurt you to put more in there does that show up on the it, it should <clears throat> I mean in in right visually on on YouTube does it show those yeah yeah so that's what you got to remember is when you're putting whatever you're putting in the title is for search engines 
but people are going to see it too. Yeah. So my, my number one rule is make it, someone's got to want to click on it. If it looks completely keyword loaded and they don't know what it's about, they're not going to, no one's going to click on it, it's not going to help you. It's a fine dance. It definitely is. Would you upload the same video five or six times under different titles just to see which one was working? You can't. That, you can't. You, you can take the same video and re-edit it, but if you try to put duplicate content, the exact same video, more than once they're going to reject it. And even if you do it under different logins, you're pushing it. You just simply have to edit it somehow, and that's it, and then re-upload it. Because there are companies who do that. They yeah. want it, you know, just because of their targeting, it's organic targeting instead of doing ads, they'll do a few different videos with a few different titles on there. Um, but it's basically inherently the same video, they just edit it a little bit. And there's also that fine dance between, um, if people, if you're pushing people to a channel, it doesn't look good usually on your channel to have a lot of the same videos over and over. So you also have to think about what your goals are. If we're using YouTube for a search and be discovered and things like that, your channel isn't so important. So if I go to your channel, I don't mind seeing a bunch of different videos on there that are kind of the same thing, just titled different. But if the goal is that you want people to come to your YouTube channel and understand who you are through your content, then it's not a good idea to make the same video with different titles. You're better having a clean channel. So you also have to think about what you're going to be using it for. And uh, keep in mind, too, that what you say in the video, because like I said about the transcriptions, either you're going you're to upload a transcription and Google's going to check, or they're going to guess what you're saying. So. If your keywords are completely irrelevant to what's in the video, it's not going to help you. And if somebody clicks on the video and they realize two seconds in, this is not what I wanted, and they back out, that hurts you. Yeah. Drop off reads on YouTube, kill you. Yeah. Actually, you're better off having everything is moving away from the tricks and it's moving mm -hmm. towards good content. Mm -hmm. So yes. create stuff. Really, the, the best thing you can do is figure out what your target market and your customers want to know about and make videos for that and do the keyword research as a secondary part um, you know figuring out what are the best combinations of words to give you the, the edge but not as the primary yeah, I mean YouTube has all sorts of algorithms built into it to see how people view your video and is it, it when I get into analytics you'll actually see you can measure drop-off rates and YouTube takes that into account so if they see that you have a thousand views and your video is a minute and a half long, but their your drop off rate where people leave the video is after like eight seconds, ten seconds, and stuff, it doesn't matter how well you keyword, it doesn't matter anything else like that. YouTube is going to devalue it. However, if you have videos where people are staying throughout the length of it in the analytics, you can see the drop off rates are really late in the video and towards the end. YouTube will help raise it up a little bit. So there's that back end stuff too that, like yeah. Mike said, it always goes back to good content. Keywording, tagging, all this stuff is vitally important, but if your content is crap, it doesn't matter how well you keyword something. So it, they go hand in hand. It's to that point, there was a great article in the New York Times about six weeks ago, maybe two months ago, about this guy who owned a pool company. And obviously in the recession, you know, boom, it went down like this. So he come marketing, you know, and, and he started to figure out, okay, I'm going to start putting this stuff on the web because that's inexpensive. And his approach was exactly what you're saying. It's just pure content. What he did is his most commonly asked questions, and he started doing videos. Right. And one of the biggest videos he ever did, which was you know scary for many of us who don't want to ever talk about price, right? Uh, he did a whole thing on price, and he talked about competitors and, and how you know a competitor, a local competitor, he's good. You should check him out too. And what happens is his content was good, it, and the recent you know the the search brought him up to the first page yeah. automatically because no one talks about price. So right. most people yeah. write in, what's the price for a book? You know, And all of a sudden he was showing up right away and, and his business took off from that yeah. because he did two things. One, he got exposure, but two, he built credibility. Even when you talk about a competitor saying, hey, he's, he does a good job and these are the differences between my company and that company. <clears throat> You, you want to check that guy out if he's being so honest. So it was really an yeah. interesting thing. He actually spun it. He now he's yeah. a small share of the pool company as a marketing company. So go figure it <laughs> It was a fascinating yeah. article. It's, 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 it's exactly what you're saying. It's not about fancy footwork and tag. You know, you got to do the tagging and all that stuff. But it's really about good content. I always say the tagging, all the stuff you do up front helps you get noticed. 
and in, from being noticed to going propelling to it being, I, I hate the word using the word viral because you can't make a video go viral. And anybody that tells you they can make a viral video for you is full of crap because viral just actually it happens. Um, but the, all this keywording and tagging, doing all these proper steps, at least gets you so that you can get noticed if nothing else. Once you're noticed the content is good, that's when it, it organically it takes off on its own. The search engine says, wow, this is a very valuable video. If anybody's searching for the keywords uh, that were put in there, this is coming up first no matter what. So it all goes hand in hand. You have to do all these things good or well. Sorry, I'm all the way me. <laughs> you have a question? Twice. Yeah. Um, could you, you said Google's going to guess what you're saying. Yeah. Is that I don't understand what you mean. What, how does that oh, transcription from the audio. What? What? Because what well, their computers it? try to transcribe what you say. In other words, you you have a video and you're talking in the video. Mm -hmm. Their machines will listen to the video, just like we have voicemails that can hear what right. we say and understand it. And the computer is going to guess what they what you say. And, and if what, what you're saying, that? what's that? They they guess what you say and then what? And okay, so then. If what you're saying in the video is completely irrelevant, like if you don't mention your keywords in your title in what you say in the video, mm -hmm. then they're going to say, no, this video is not relevant. And what will they do? And they'll just, they'll disassociate. Or, you know, what's, what's going to happen is if you have a video for Video Marketing Shelton, where I say Video Marketing Shelton 20 times in the video, and you have a video that says Video Marketing Shelton and I talk about grasshoppers, Google's going to put this one up high, and the other one's going to be on page 300. Okay. So that's what's going to happen. They're not going to like not okay. show the video. Up, uh, that's is that what you were asking? Well, I just didn't really understand what you were saying. So it I doesn't think. show. Well, sorry. <clears throat> well, also, weren't you saying that if someone um, needs closed captioning right. when that's they're watching the video, then the Google's version of your transcription is what's going to show up at the bottom of the screen, and it might be gibberish. Uh -huh. Yeah, right. As opposed to what you were <clears throat> saying. As opposed to you uploading what you wanted to say. Money back. And uploading what you money back. Money back. If you upload it for them, I mean, we don't we don't know exactly what Google's doing. They don't share us their secrets with us. Yeah. But we assume we think that if we help them out with a good transcription that they're going to look at that more. That. Basically, it. that's the word. It. So producing videos. I like to start with a hook because you really only have maybe six, eight, ten seconds to get somebody to want to continue watching. So you want to start with, I don't recommend starting with a big intro or your logo. Start with, here's what I'm going to talk about in the video today. <clears throat> or did you know the five reasons why blah, blah, blah. You know, kind of like a TV show. What can we hook, how can we hook them to stay through the commercials? So you do that and then then you can go into your um, your little intro or logo, and then you can do the the meat and potatoes of what you want to say. Um, good rule of thumb is the video should be as long as it needs to be to stay interesting. In general, I don't like to make a video longer than two minutes unless it's like a a class. But I have a video. <clears throat> here's an example. I have my my wife's a wedding photographer, and I never thought this would work. But we put a video that's like. 45 minutes long, and it's just a slideshow of their wedding, of some, one of her, her brides, one of their weddings. And it's just 45 minutes of slides. But it was in the Dominican Republic. And when I look at the retention rate, the analytics, almost, so it's got about 150 views for about a month. And like 80% of the people watch the whole video. It's a long time to that's that's not, But that's not my demographic. It's the groom all day. <laughs> <laughs> so, and the family. And the family. So, to me, it was nauseating. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't even sit through my own wedding. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, but in general, you know, most videos are like two minutes. Just two minutes or less. If you can do it in a minute, don't do. Don't try to make it longer. Just. You, you always try to think about what's going to be interesting because, like Bill said, people, if they bail after a minute and your video is three minutes, that's not helping. You'd rather them watch, orchestrate it so they watch the whole thing. And, like Mike said, the exception is if you're doing educational materials, things like that. 
when I do webinars or seminars that were videotaped and like that, um, they could be an hour long, like even today or something like that could be an hour long or so. Um, but I've also tried experimenting with breaking apart in pieces, like if I have an hour long seminar, I have tried uh, and experimented with breaking it into like 10 minute segments just to see how it is. And I didn't really see a huge difference with them and I actually saw some disconnect between watching video one through like for some reason number one was had X amount of views and number four had X amount of views so it didn't really jive together. So I went back to just doing the full length, I figured people can pause and or bookmark, because you can also mark where you are and things like that in playlists. So um, I've stayed with the long format ones. But like Mike said, for in general, most videos, especially content marketing, what you're talking about, less than two minutes is, is key. Every analytics I ever see for videos where um, it's marketing, um, the drop off rate started about a minute 30, minute 40, and you start getting beyond there, and that's about it. If you have something that's really quite basic for your channel, so you're only going to have eight for a long time or something, are they just in order if someone goes to your channel? Are they just going to be the most recent one that comes up first? Well, so Google or YouTube just changed to this, mm -hmm. it's called One Channel. They just updated everything like recently. I like it actually. The branding sucks. Yeah, the branding sucks, but <laughs> there's a lot more uh, functionality where you can, the first thing that you can do is um, you can decide if somebody's brand new to your channel, which video that shows first. And we call it the trailer video. So you, it's good to make us a video that's designed to hook them to subscribe to your channel. Mm -hmm. But your question is, you can you can set up playlists and you can order them however you like. So it'll show up. You can, you can tell the page how to show up. Okay, so two things that are, in my opinion, experience the most important when it comes to making videos look good. So this is about how can we take a flip cam or a hundred hour camera or an iPhone, even though I don't have an iPhone, I wish I had an iPhone now. How can we do that and still make fool people into thinking that we made, we hired somebody to make our videos. And the trick is lots of light. Cheap cameras need lots of light because they have really small sensors and there's not a lot of lens. My uh, $3,000 digital SLR, I can take a camera in pitch black and make it look good. But this, you know, these kind of cameras need lots of light. And the other reason you want to use lots of light, or you want to have any light, like so if we were in this room, I'd still want to set up, like I have a, I have a little portable kit of, um, it's called a softbox, so it's just, it's a, it's a light on a stand, and it's got um, a box with a fluorescent light in it, and it's got like a screen over it. So I'd want to have at least one of those pointing at the subject's face. For nothing more, at the very least, having the little lights in their eyes. Mm. That's called a catch light. So if you've ever seen somebody you know, close up on TV or a photograph, and you see the little sparkle in their eyes, mm -hmm. compared to not seeing that, like I'm looking at you right now, I could see it. Look around, you can probably see the reflections from the fluorescence. So that's important because it makes it makes you seem more lively. And it just when you, sh I actually have a video on my channel where I, I show lights off, lights on, and it's actually it's titled all about lighting. Um, so that's something that's going to make it look good. But the lighting, um, in general, three pieces. One's kind of um, on your head, kind of facing the background called the hair light. That's so that you look, you kind of pop out from the background, it kind of makes, it adds a little to it. And then two lights in the front, one kind of right on you and one off to the side. So you got a, you know, one's called a fill light, one's called a, um, a key light. But you don't need to get fancy with that, but just most of the videos, most of the, the amateur videos that I see have no light. They're dark and dingy and it's just, it's not cool. So just by getting getting some lights at Home Depot or getting some lamps or doing it outside or standing by the window, try to have lots of light. And like I'm like I was just saying, if you can have a light pointing at your eyes, at your face to kind of make it look uh, better, I could do that. And then the other thing is good sound. So a video that looks great but doesn't sound good, like it sounds like you're in a tunnel or it's just hard to hear. Um, you're going to lose people, and sound. You know, 
one thing that I've noticed with um, videos is the music. Having, you know, if you're talking in the video, you don't want to have uh, the music blaring. But if you're going to cut away to some pictures or some other footage, having some cool music can really add emotion to the video. And I've noticed a big difference between one, I did a video recently and I spent an hour trying to find the right song. And um, it made a big difference. So just the sound, we're very, you know, the sound really makes a big difference to the experience of the, the viewer. Do you have to be careful with music and the copyright issue and what you can play or not do. play? do. But they've been really good about it lately, I have to say, YouTube. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of things I've grabbed from iTunes that now they on the back end just basically add it as part of their advertising in the back end. It'll say to buy this song. Do this, oh. so you don't have to be as fearful as you used to. But it's a good idea to avoid that at all costs, unless it's something that you really, really feel strongly you need to use. Um, so yeah, because the other thing is, if they take the audio track out from you, you can get screwed. Because if it's a voiceover or things like that, or anything that you've overlaid, they'll silence the, the video and it'll just be image only. And then you got to re-record with the audio track. So you got to be really careful. Um, I use iMovie personally, and iMovie has like 300, 400 songs already on there. And yeah, they're this standard kind of like, you know, you can choose eight or ten different jazz beats. You can choose like this. But like Mike said, it, you know, you'd spend a little time going through the list of the songs that are available. You can usually find something that matches up to the video pretty darn well. You know? It's not like Pink Floyd, Floyd and uh, Wizard of Oz, but, you know, it's, it goes along pretty good. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, in the types of videos that that we're probably talking about here where, and I, I don't know if this is clear to everyone or I just assume it, but I, I imagine local businesses, service type companies, where it's going to be you, either the owner or representative on camera, talking. I mean, it could be a voiceover with slides or animations or whatever, but in general, I like to use this, you know, the personal, um, which I'm going to talk to you about in a second, you know, doing stuff that is natural, unscripted, you're talking about stuff you already know about. So with, with this being said, you're not going to want to have Pink Floyd or Led Zeppelin playing in the background. You're going to want to have... Tupac Shakur. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, if you have a tattoo shop, I guess. But um, generally, you're going to want to have like stock type music, like the stuff that comes out of the movie. Um, you know, it's Mozart. stuff art. We use a lot of classical music too, because classical music is considered basically free right. I actually use a lot of Mozart, like in the beginnings of my like my training videos and stuff. Like I, all my videos start to do, 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 I think it's piano concerto number eleven in D minor by Mozart. Well, you're like, learning about culture. I know Mozart inside, but it's you know it's the same piano theme, and I actually use it as part of my branding, so that when the video starts, my logo comes up with that Mozart tune. It's do 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 do. So every time it's like a branding kind of thing for me now to start with my logo and that song. And Mike well, goes, da 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 da. Yeah. <laughs> he does the sixth movement though. It's a little The sixth movement? <laughs> yeah, nice, Bill. Nice. But so you, you can buy, you, I mean, you can buy, like I typically go to places like, uh, like Pond 5 or Melody Loops. Those are two places where you can get Five to twenty bucks for a track that you can re you know that you own the license to that you can use over and over again. What were you saying? I was going to ask you: Are you going to talk a little bit more about good sound as opposed to oh, the music? Right. Yeah. I think I glossed over the actual recording of the, the talking. Thanks. Thanks for reminding me. Um, so the built-in microphones on virtually any camera are that great. So I always always use an external mic. And I'm not doing it today. I mean, today, uh, you know, we by right should have uh, be mic'd on wireless. But so actually, what I'm doing today, I have two cameras in the background, and these are my cheapo cameras because my pro cameras can't run unattended. They, 15 minutes, they shut off. Um, so what I'm doing here is I have another recorder. This has really good uh, sound. It's got two microphones. This is like a $60 thing, I think. This is probably outdated at this point. Sony IC recorder. But for a lot of the videos, I have a little lapel mic that I'll clip to my shirt or whoever we're doing the video for and plug it right to the camera. Um, those are like 30 bucks. 
and they sound great. If your camera, you know, if you have a, a phone or a camera that doesn't have a mic input, then you can record um, separately and then sync them together in editing. Mm -hmm. Scary, huh? <laughs> so, but yeah, you need to have a higher mic yeah. part. <laughs> there, there's, uh, it's, it's not that bad. The best way to do that is to make a loud noise, a like clap, so that you can you visually see the loud noise. Mm -hmm. And when you're editing, whoever's editing can easily line things up. Speaking of editing, um, you way, don't have to do that. Sound, sound is imperative. There's so many videos, especially like training videos I've come across, where the video looks beautiful. It's almost like HD quality. And the guy's like, like Mike said, he's like in a bathroom or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's like horrible because you can only listen for so long and then you start tuning out because you're, you're like straining to hear the sound on there. So I'm a big believer in audio is, I even to me, my opinion a lot of times is audio is sometimes a little bit more important than the video sometimes because while people might tune in and out of the actual image because other things going on in the room and everything, mm. they they're kind of tuned into your voice and if the content is good and what they're saying is good, they're tuning into that. And if bad quality is, it's terrible. So the editing, you can always find somebody to edit for you. Uh, I mean, there's there are, I have clients that do their own videos and I do the rest of it. You know, I'll, I'll edit it and I'll upload it to all the, the hard stuff. Um, so really, I think the most important part, if you guys were to do this yourself, is getting the, you know, the the top, figuring out the topic and figuring out getting a good performance. You're getting, you're saying, but definitely when, when you're going to edit the video, however you do it, you put your logo in there, put um, what's called a lower third, where you know the part that it shows up below that tells who's talking, or you have sometimes you might have your website show up. That's called a lower third. You want to have some of that in there. Um, a slide at the end that shows your contact information. The music, um, and so the the last part where I'm going to talk about when you're in front of the camera. If, if you're not great with just coming up with stuff impromptu, and you script things, like which I tend to, I tend to when I make video, my videos, I'll write out a script, and then I'll I'll deliver it line by line, and then in editing, I'll do what's called a jump cut. So picture I have my script. So I'm going to stand there. I'm not going to hold the paper, but so I'm going to say, "Hi, this is Mike Levinson with CT Local Marketing." I'm going to stand there, look still. I'm going to say, "Today I'm going to talk about social media marketing with Bill DeRosa." So then, in editing, I'm going to cut out the blank spots and put it together because, uh, you know, using editing wizardry. And this might be kind of advanced, but you can you can do that, and you can do that yourself and have a good editor make it look wonderful. And there's actually a good reason to do that because you, it's not going to look jerky like you might think it would. People, in my experience, are going to say, are going to appreciate that you're cutting out the dead spots, in the sake of efficiency, and getting the message, you're getting in and out, you're cutting out the irrelevant stuff. And a lot of times, I'll tape. If I'm working with a client, I'll tape for hours to get a two-minute video. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for, you know, when I talk about go unscripted, we sit down, we have a, a list of topics that we think might be good. Like Matt Lauer, I'm going to sit there and interview you. And then uh, I'm not going to be on camera, I'm going to be off to the side, but I'll go back into editing and I'm going to sift through all the footage and I'm going to say these are the little nuggets. These are the things that make that person look great. And that's the stuff that I'm going to put in the video. So, um, another thing, doing this, if you were to do this on your own, it's a great experience to learn. Um, watching yourself do this in a video is a great way to perfect your future videos and speaking and any of that kind of stuff that you might want to do. So, the last thing I didn't mention is when you're, when you're talking, you're either, if it's... Uh, the interview style like I talked about, when you're talking to another physical person, that's wonderful because you're not even looking at the camera, you're talking to another person. But if you're, if you're looking right at the camera, try to imagine that you're, it's somebody that you know that you're talking to. Don't address 
the American public, like the president. <laughs> you know, <laughs> pretend you're talking to your best friend, hang a picture. I have uh, one client hang a, hung a picture of Louis C.K. under the camera, because that's just something that made him feel good. It's be, you know. um, People of Earth. All right, so uh, I guess we'll get into the social media. And I know uh, we're running a little late, so I'll blast through this stuff. Um, so leverage social media. One of the things about video, obviously, is that it's so easy to share. Once it's on a hosting platform such as YouTube or Vimeo or all these other applications, and even we're going to get into Vine and Instagram, even those type of videos are, are very shareable now. Um, that's one of the great benefits about making this stuff. It's stuff that you can use over and over. Social signals help ranking. Um, more and more the algorithms are starting to move towards indexing content, indexing the things you say out there, judging your content for relevancy to re help raise overall organic SEO and things like that. And as a little inside Facebook, for example, is going to start indexing what you say on Facebook to deliver ads and all these other things. So even the, if somebody writes in the, on their wall now, uh, within the next few months. Uh, I just bought a new pocketbook from J.C. Penney. Um, you're going to get an ad from J.C. Penney probably in your next visit on there because it's going to be in the back end. Um, so it does help with social ranking and all these other different things. There's a lot of interconnectivity now between content and um, well, organic SEO and ad delivery and all these other things. So as marketers, you also have to think about um, maybe not with the consumer eye, but as a marketing eye, when you put content out there and people are talking about similar content, it will show up if it's done the right way. Um, views beget views. I mean, obviously, we talked a little earlier about the pool guy. I mean, that was a great example. Um, he used all the keywords and everything else to get his video noticed, but then once people started viewing it and viewing it in excess, his rankings all went up, more and more people connected to his content, and good content always drives uh, what you're going to get out of it, results from it, ROI, and everything else. Posts on social media. Um, Stadia posts among different platforms. There's a strategy behind how you use social media dissemination of content. Where actually there's a slide about this, I won't get too deep. Uh, include the YouTube media link. Um, always. I mean, you always want to be able to point people. And I'm a big fan of always using HTTP wherever available um, because of indexing and everything else like that. And also points people specifically. Putting a live link rather than expecting somebody to copy and paste the link is a big difference. People are lazy. If I see a link that I really can't click on, a lot of times I ignore it unless it's like something super spectacular that I'm willing to copy and paste and do all that. But give people live links to go into. It's, you know, one thing, I, when I talked about in the description of the YouTube video, cutting your, your link, you always put that first. Because this way, when somebody's watching the YouTube video, the description, you have to click on it to see all of it, but usually you see the first line. So you can usually have a link right below the video will be a live clickable link if you do it that way. Yeah. And you always want it to be a live link, so always remember that. Um, consider Facebook YouTube ads. YouTube ads aren't actually that bad, uh, that expensive, and but it all goes back and even with the Facebook ads. Remember what I said, if you can geographically target ads on YouTube or Facebook or things like that, you won't spend a lot of money. It's a few dollars per day uh, at most. If you have to do nationwide, then I suggest like breaking it into cities and then geographically doing ads that way rather than doing a nationwide sweep of things. Pick pockets of areas in the nation. And sometimes it goes to a little bit of a market research. I'm a big fan of doing market research. Research where your customers are. Understand where your customers are. Understand the demographics behind your customers. Because when you're talking about targeting, the more parameters you can collect and more information about your target audience that you can collect, the easier and less expensive ads become. They go hand in hand. Um, lots of ways to repurpose your video, we said earlier. I mean, you put something on YouTube, you can share it on every social platform there is. And we'll talk about dissemination. Podcasts, guest blogs, social bookmarking. Those are other things that um, you can use your, your videos for. Do you want to get into a little oh, bit of yes. social? Oh, yes. So I, I, we talked about like different video hosting platforms in the beginning. So when I typically, I'll post YouTube as the main place, but I'll also take that same video and I'll post it to all the other um, video hosting sites like Vimeo, Vidler, Vidipedia, BO. There's all these, I don't even know all of them. There's a lot of them. Now. There's a lot. <laughs> so duplicate content is okay in that case because they're different platforms. You're not putting multiple videos on one. And social bookmarking is great too. Um, stumble upon things like that. You know those type of social bookmarking sites and Dig and all these other ones that you can post them up there. It's, as many places you can put it, it helps with organic SEO. Yeah. 
All right, so best practices for your video content strategy. And this is really for any social content. Um, I see too many people who, let's say, they make a YouTube video and immediately they tweet it out. It's posted to their Facebook page. It's on their LinkedIn. It's on their Google+. Plus. All of a sudden, if anybody has an iPhone, you know, you get notifications. And all of a sudden, my iPhone lights up that somebody put out this piece of content. I actually said, I get an email and they've uploaded nine YouTube videos. And my email goes, boop, boop, Sandler uploaded a new video. Sandler uploaded a new video. My Twitter goes, Sandler uploaded. All of a sudden, I've got like, they've uploaded seven pieces of video all in one shot because I guess that's when I were able to sit at the computer. And everything in my entire world lights up that they've just uploaded a video and there's seven different videos. Guess what? I'm not watching one of them because you've just overwhelmed me with so much content one time. It's like I can't, I can't process it, so I just ignore it. Um, so a really good idea for any content, video, and everything else, you post that YouTube up. You can always immediately tweet it out because Twitter is one of those platforms that moves so fast, information gets buried so quickly that you don't annoy people on Twitter as much as you do on a lot of those social networks. So I usually say like immediately tweet it out, um, post to Facebook later that day, post to Pinterest the next day. You're extrapolating out, you're not overwhelming people with content all at one shot. Okay. The other thing is, there's a lot of studies that if you think about pieces of content in the digital world, they live for, let's just as an average of two hours when you're taking Twitter and Pinterest and all this stuff and how much information people collect in. So if a piece of content lives for two hours and you dump it across all social networks, it lives basically for two hours. If you extend that by posting one day on the here, it lives two hours. You post the next day on another social network, it lives two hours. You're actually extrapolating out the amount of time that information is out there. And the other thing is, I'm a big fan of analytics. By changing up how you post things out there at different days and times on different social networks, you're actually collecting data on when people are receptive to the information. Now, I'm always a long-term thinker, so I'm thinking after three, four months when you have a proper dissemination of content and you start gathering the information and data behind it, which might seem a little complex on the surface, but analytics are really very simple when you're just looking at key point indicators and stuff like that. But you start collecting this big, huge warehouse of data coming in and analytics based on Facebook doesn't seem to be great on Wednesdays for my audience, but it seems like Thursday is a great day. Um, Pinterest seems to have more action at 8 o'clock at night than it did at noon. Things like that. So when you start collecting this data by staggering how you put content out there, you have a better understanding long term of when you should put that content out there on what social networks and how people are receiving it. So there's a lot of reasons behind why you have a, a content strategy of dissemination. And it, it's really important long term. I just thought of something that uh, I just thought about recently that another person recommended was when you're posting, so the main thing you want to have is the, the live link the, to the video. So HTTP, whatever the YouTube link is. But have some kind of teaser in the post. And instead of just saying, hey, here's my new video, check it out, say, hey, Check out what happens at 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. Right. You got to see the outtake at the end. Right. You know, something like that. Something that. A hook. A hook, yeah. Absolutely. Um, and the other thing is, don't describe the video the same way on each social network. Um, there's different languages on different social networks. And I'm a big fan of auto post programs like Hootsuite, Sprout Social, these other ones. The problem is, a lot of people use it incorrectly, and they basically do a copy paste of the language from one social network to another. And audiences, respond to different levels of engagement in different language. On Twitter, it's more succinct. Use a hashtag or two that would be relevant to it. Um, but it's a short, very short description. On Facebook, write about it and ask an opinion. Or use a teaser like Mike said. What did you think about this video? What are your experiences with whatever the topic is? Things like that. On LinkedIn, you need to be more of a thought leader uh, or somebody who is a leader of your industry. So you would describe that video a little differently on LinkedIn. So depending on what social network you're sharing this to, understand the audience that's on there and how they want to receive the language of how you're describing this video. Okay. That was great. Well, you, I, I've never heard it put that way. What's that? So you got, well, it's, uh, in my mind, so you got Twitter, you kind of, you're, you're blasting out. Succinct. Very succinct, succinct and hashtags. And a hashtag or two. Facebook, you're looking to start, you get opinions and start a conversation. conversation. You have all the comments below. Mm -hmm. And then LinkedIn, you're being a thought leader. You're, yeah. you're portraying yourself as an expert. Absolutely. This, each social network, and actually I just did a <coughs> webinar yesterday. Um, 
there's going to be a, a, a deeper and deeper segregation of social networks as time goes on. The days of a Facebook are kind of over. Not that Facebooks are going anywhere, but you're starting to see more and more um, social networks that have a specific task or a specific tool or a specific function. Instagram is a, a prime example of that. Vine is a prime example. Thumb is one. Medium. All these different sort of feed. Uh, all these different social networks that are coming out have. Sorry, well, P A G E D is like a French. Yeah. Okay, so we all are not social media experts. Well, I'm not. Let me speak for myself. I have been told that you really shouldn't go and have a Facebook page unless you're going to really tend to it weekly. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah. so you don't just throw things out there because you can. You, you really have to know what you're. Let's take what a, you can do, is that correct? Let's take is a step back. The first thing you should even do before we even talk about social is understand where your audience is first right. and then be on the social networks that match your target audience. Because too many companies jump on, I'm, I love Facebook, but it's not relevant for all companies. Right. There is clients of mine who I've talked out of having a Facebook mm -hmm. presence, anything more than ancillary, just because they need a presence there. You should have some kind of presence. It has. I don't want to get geeky on it, but it has what's called API. There's good plugins to it, which are the applications that you can then go from there. So it's a, Facebook's always a good central kind of location, but how much time and effort you actually put into curating it is depending on where your audience is. There's companies that really should only be on LinkedIn and Twitter, and really that's about it. Um, and, and you're 100% right. So you have to first understand where your audience is, have the presence there, and then we talk about dissemination throughout all these things. Yeah, I wasn't using examples that you have to be on all these social networks I'm talking about, but it just happens to be whatever social networks you are on, you have to understand the dissemination, the language behind I each one. I understand that. Now, what about all the video sites that you've mentioned, none of which I've heard of before? <laughs> oh. Well, I, I usually favor YouTube, but you know, Mike. Uh, but throwing them out to all of yeah, them. Yeah, that's that's fine. That's because... purely for the search engines. Okay. Yeah, and th that's for for linking. So okay. yeah, I, I know it's, it's it gets confusing. I mean, a lot. Again, always if you're going to do anything, it's about the content, and it's about knowing your target market. Yeah. A lot of the other stuff is tricks if you have the time. There's a ton of information by Googling to understand what each social network is. Um, Facebook, like for example, is actually moving to more of an adult audience. The kids are all, all the teens in the young 20s jumped off of Facebook because their parents jumped on. That's basically it. <laughs> Mom and dad got on Facebook, all the kids left. Now all the kids are more on like um, quick hit places like Instagram and Vine and even Twitter has a very uh, a, a large section of youth uh, attracting to it and stuff. Um, LinkedIn, for example, you know, LinkedIn everybody should know is a more of a B2B professional, very business oriented thing. It's usually a, a, a little higher income level. Pinterest, for example, is 75% women. That one has a very high income level. It's 100,000. So actually one of the highest income levels of all social networks, believe it or not, is Pinterest. It's around 100,000 or more, and it's mostly female audience. So absolutely, if you research these social networks, you can get all the demographic breakdowns that you need. Um, Pew Industries, actually, I think it's Pew Industries, right? Is that Pew? It's P-E-W, I forgot. The For the Latin. press? Yeah. They're, 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 the research company, Pew, whatever, um, they actually have a lot of reports. If you go to theirs and you search social networks, there's a ton of data there that really defines each social network really well to find the social network. Okay, drilling down one more time on sure. that. Um, cable, for instance, will tell you at what times during the day okay, certain audiences are likely to attend to their messages. They have that as well. They have that as well? Yeah. Here's the thing about that, and I'll... I'll, I'll you make your own analytics. I'm a big fan of, and this is why I say I always think long term. The reports that come out a lot of times where the best times to tweet on Twitter are, they're mostly based on big brands because that's the data they can usually collect. Um, not for nothing, the local hardware store does not have the same audience as Subway restaurants. So a lot of these best times to post are great to start off with as a general rule of idea of like when the, the social network's hot. But I'm a huge fan of you always make your own analytics. If you go through the proper steps and you think long term, you, by doing dissemination of content, you understand your specific audience through the data, then you make your own best times to post. And don't forget also, like East Coast, like for us over here, 
There's a total dead zone usually in social media of about 4.30 to 5.30 or 6 o'clock because people are leaving work, they're wrapping up for the day, they're driving home, they see their family. They're not sitting on a mobile phone while they're, well, some people do while they're sitting in traffic <laughs> um, while they're driving home. But there's dead zones that are very geographically located where if you look at some of the things like the reports, they'll say like, you know, four to six is like one of the best times to post. But yeah, that would report was actually in California, <laughs> you know, like kind of thing. And so you got to like understand also what your geographic and what your audience is. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, any other questions about that? Okay. All right, so um, we talked about YouTube, um, and this can kind of go for any social network or any video. Always be sure to brand your channel. Graphics should remain consistent from social network to social network. I'm a huge fan of branding. Um, never before, I think, has branding been as important because people have so many assets in the digital world now. And I'm horrified sometimes when I look at companies' things and I dig through their social media and stuff, and the thumbnail on Twitter is not the same logo as here, and you go to their YouTube channel and the whole top section is like an old graphic from whatever, but you go to their website and there's a completely different look, and um, you read the descriptions across social network, social network, they're all mismoshed and everything. Um, you need to define a thumbnail and a cover photo. Those two items always. Um, and what I mean by a thumbnail is that's usually the little tiny picture that represents you when you have conversations or discussions pretty much anywhere in a digital world. And then what I consider the cover photo, which is kind of like Facebook based, but the cover photo is usually they give you one large image that can go across the top of a page or, or a channel or anything else like that. I'm a big fan that those need to be consistent. If you change one, for a promotion or something like that, I think you should change all of them for a promotion. The thumbnail, I always usually say, should remain consistent. That's your logo that represents you no matter where you go. But on your pages and your YouTube channels and things like that, that graphic at the top needs to be branded across everything. Also, the description. Um, you know, use keywords. Optimize your channel, for example, on YouTube with keywords, and you be sure to use all links available. YouTube does index also the, those types of sections. So how you describe yourself in the information section is also keyword rich. They do look at those, those things. Um, and across all social networks, make sure that the language is consistent. If you were going to search Google or use the tools that Mike was talking about earlier, use those in some parts of the description of, of you as well. So two things I just thought of. Um, so first of all, I mean, the bottom line is use all fields available. When you're going, setting up your YouTube channel, go through everything and don't leave any blank. Fill out the descriptions, the keywords, whatever it, it lets you do. And the other thing is, um, I just blanked out. <laughs> <laughs> Press the reset. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, citations. What that means is, what's your main company phone number, website, mailing address, or whatever you're going to use. Keep that consistent. So. Um, Pick, are you going to use Avenue or are you going to use Av? Road or, or Road written out. You know, figure that out and use that the same everywhere. That's going to help you a lot in just overall website search engines. Yeah, always be consistent. And of course, YouTube, we already went over 100 times as huge SEO, just like all of them. I want to talk a little bit about applications because a lot of the world is moving towards mobile and applications lead to mobile, obviously. Vine or Instagram, first of all, who's here has heard of Vine? Who uses Vine? You use Vine? <laughs> Vine's like my one of my favorite things. I get like I don't know how many videos up there now. I just walk around. I'm doing all this cool stuff. Um, but Vine is, uh, and I don't want to get too deep into them because you can find out the actual process. So, but basically, both of these are mobile things where it's an app. You use it. You open it up, and you use your phone to videotape things. Uh, Vine is six seconds. Actually, I'll go to the next one. Ooh, there you go. All right. Um, so Instagram versus Vine. While the similar in concept, Instagram video is not a repackaged version of Vine. Just so people understand, Vine is owned by Twitter, and it was released before uh, it was. It grew really fast, more rapidly than Instagram. Instagram is actually a little bit older. Facebook bought it about a year ago or so, and it had a little steady kind of influx uh, of traffic. So they're both products that are made by huge social network. Uh, entities. Twine, Vitter, uh, Vitter is Twine. <laughs> okay. is twine nice. <laughs> Twitter is Vine and Instagram is owned by Facebook. Okay, And some of the differences, length, Instagram videos can be 15 seconds, Vine videos are only 6 seconds. Okay, 
Vine videos loop when you watch them. Instagram videos do not loop. Now, where that comes into play is the creativity that you can use behind there. I am a big fan of the looping videos if the content that you put up there or whatever it is deserves a loop. Other than that, the loop is actually a little bit of an, of an annoyance, um, where Instagram is not a loop. It plays the 15 seconds and you have to hit play to go again. All right. Um, Post-production, Vine has absolutely no editing. Whatever you shoot in that six seconds is what you get. At least Instagram has some editing. They have, you can delete a couple of scenes, you can use some filters and things like that. The big difference between the two of them is, realistically, Instagram has been the one that's been taking off and the one I would recommend concentrating on a little bit more. And the backstory behind that is Facebook owns Instagram. and Facebook has um, stated, I'm a Facebook developer, so I get a lot of inside information from Facebook uh, because I get a lot of platforms and I get a lot of news early because we have to change APIs to match whatever the new kind of thing is coming out. Um, Instagram is going to be tied heavily into Facebook ads and the ad platform and search and delivery and all these other things. Um, whereas Vine, Twitter kind of said that they don't want to ever include Vine in ad delivery and stuff like that. So as far as marketing, if you're going to choose between the two, I would recommend doing Instagram. Okay. Now as far as they work, it's a mobile app and as long as you touch your screen or your phone, it records. So you can hold the screen the whole time and blast through all 6 seconds or 15 seconds or every time you tap your phone, it just records a, a little sliver. Now. As far as how you do initiatives and stuff like that, if you're creative, there's ways to use these platforms for awesome video marketing if you could create stories around them and things like that, which you know Mike would, would help you in that respect. Um, but the cool thing is, no matter what, they work in the, when you're done with the videos, they work like YouTube or anything else. They can be shared everywhere. You can tweet them out. You can share them to Facebook. You can do a lot of different things. But a lot of the future is moving towards these mobile units where it's simplistic. Remember I said earlier segregation of social networks with simplistic tools. These are the two of the most popular video tools. And I think they'll be the two ones that everybody uses for quite a while. So start thinking about these a little more, yeah. Since I think it's new to most of us, could you just give an example of a campaign that you might have around Instagram? Yeah. What they, a lot of companies do is like for products, for example, mm -hmm. how it's made kind of things, like kind of those things, like they show like something coming on, like starting from a production line, like one of these, it's Plastico, I think is the name of the company, who does this really well. They make these cool little plastic figures, like uh, Star Wars kind of stuff, real mm -hmm. pretty cool stuff that people collect. So what they do is, they actually did one that was really popular, where they started with a lump of plastic, they filmed it for, you got 15 seconds on Instagram, they filmed it for like a second, then they put it in the next phase, they filmed it for a second. So it's actually a pretty cool video, is you see the thing go from this lump of plastic, and it goes do 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 and then all the way, and then it's sitting there, and it, I think it was uh, Boba Fett, or whatever. Mm. Uh, but it was an actually pretty cool, interesting 15 second video. Mm. And this is where, you know, creativity is hard for these. My videos actually aren't that great, to be honest. I mean, I do a lot of just goof around. Uh, I do out on a boat kind of stuff, wakeboarding and all these other things that, you know, I get a lot of hits, but marketing-wise, it's not, you know, a great initiative. Mm -hmm. I'm not that creative with video, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, so, you know, I would have, like, Mike come up with an initiative for me kind of thing. Um, but I've done some cool things because it's also stop motion. Mm -hmm. Some of my popular ones was, I set my iPhone up in a stand in a solid place and I had a white piece of paper and I had a dice, one dice. So what I did was I put it on, I put it on three and then I tapped my phone for a split second. I turned it to four. I tapped it. I turned it to one. So actually when you looking at the video for the six second loop, it's actually like 40 frames of all the dice movements. So you don't even see it just like that. With Vine and Instagram, when you tap your screen as a user looking at a video, you actually pause the video. So it's actually like a random dice generator that I made that was pretty creative, where you just see the dice go and you tap it. So instead of having a roll dice, you use your iPhone. So it was actually pretty cool. The other one I did that was really popular was um, I have this little one of those for the eight ball thing for your answer. You can have, yeah, actually someone did a really awesome one with an eight ball. It was a virtual eight ball and he did the same thing. He cut out pieces of paper, wrote all these things on it, and it was like 30 or 40 pieces of paper. And the same thing, it just goes, so you ask it its fortune, you tap it, it says you will, blah, blah, blah. 
Um, another one that I made up was that there's a lot of here's where but creativity and long term, you know, when you I'm not that creative, like I said, but if you can come up with initiatives behind these things, they could be awesome. The other one I made was a slot machine. I had this little mini slot machine on my outdoor pool cabana thing. So what I did was, again, I set my iPhone up in the stand, I pulled the slot machine, I waited until it stopped, and I just tapped the phone for a split second. So now it's like a virtual slot machine. It just goes, and every time it landed on like something where I won, it goes, woo, I go, woo, like that for a split second. So it's funny watching a video, you don't hear anything, but every once in a while you hear, woo, So it kind of gives you a clue that you could win there, so, but stuff like that. So, but only people who follow you will see those things. Yeah, um, well, no, it's open to the public. The, one of the things about these two is nobody has to actually, even with YouTube and stuff, you don't actually have to follow somebody to watch a YouTube video. That's what's great about a lot of these, you know, the social networking. But they don't have to follow you to like your video, um, to, to like see your videos and things like that. They can simply go find them. And hashtagging, uh, we didn't get into much hashtagging, but hashtagging is part of the new SEO and content marketing. Um, you'll start noticing that more and more hashtags are like everywhere now. Facebook, they're on Instagram, find all these things. Um, so that's going to be part of being found as well on some of these apps is the proper hashtags. Um, any questions about that at all, Vine or Instagram? But it's something to keep in mind on and it's something where, you know, it, it's hard to come up with creative campaigns where, you know, someone, you bring somebody in who can create a campaign for you around these things. So there's been some awesome stuff done. Um, this little thing, a picture speaks a thousand words, but video speaks a thousand more. I'm a huge fan of um, all images and videos. Images and videos are the new content, SEO, and engagement tools. We're moving more and more away from kind of like text-based to more visual, where the actual visuals or videos carry the content for you. Um, Facebook actually even has a rule uh, for ads or sponsored stories and things like that, that uh, whatever you're promoting cannot have more than 20% text in the image. So you actually, if you put an ad on Facebook and it has more than 20% text, it won't be allowed. You can't promote it. So keep that in mind, stuff like that. And more and more social networks are going to kind of do that, which I don't like. But um, Brand your visuals. Um, I'm a big fan of putting watermarks on images, even videos. I like, um, like in corners of videos, making sure you brand your stuff. Um, just because it's so easy to share content these days and you want credit for it no matter where it goes. So making sure that you watermark images, videos, all this other stuff as well as you can, I think is going to be imperative long term. Hey, do you know, um, and this is the last slide just so you know, so. When, uh, I know when you're, when you're uploading a picture to like for your website, it's important to have a good title like in the file name because mm -hmm. then you can actually get found in a, a image search. Absolutely. Does that carry into, uh, like does it matter at having the right title, having your picture yes. titled before you upload it to Facebook? Yeah. Um, every picture I put up on Facebook now has social media marketing JPEG with three separate words. And it hasn't launched yet, but I'm, is anybody know what graph search is on Facebook? You know, probably yeah, again. yeah, it looks different again. There's a search <laughs> bar. But anyway, in the back end of why they introduced graph search, graph search is going to be their quote unquote competition to Google, which it's never going to compete with Google because one is SEO kind of driven with keywords while graph search is more relevancy through your friends and contacts and stuff like that. But in any event, um, Part of graph search and the ongoing uh, way that Facebook is going to have people find content relevant to them and things like that is they are going to take the final names of the images you upload onto Facebook into consideration for what people find eventually in graph search. And like Mike said, it happens with Google Images too. You have to tag your images properly for you to come up in an image search on Google. So to me, it's always a good idea now, no matter what you upload, change the file name to something that is search or relevant to that image or video you're putting up there. I think it's going to become imperative as more and more um, these algorithms and search and everything move more towards finding things that are relevant even within images and videos. Um, yeah. Are you talking about the title when it says title name or the actual link itself? The actual image when you have that that picture on your desktop on your computer and it's file uh, XYZ yeah, like one two three dot jpeg right. take everything up before the dot jpeg and title it the way you feel it should be searched like all my images now and videos i put up everywhere are social media marketing dot jpeg no matter what picture it is no matter what it is no matter what i upload to facebook now so you might keep it in Twitter. your files as xyz file but when it once it goes up to your website yeah. you rename it what i do is i change the name on my desktop then i upload it and once it's uploaded i go back and i just 
I leave the name or I'll do social media or would have won or whatever else like that because I don't care how it's stored because I'm really organized with my folders so everything goes in like very specific places. Well, you could do social media marketing and then say what the picture is too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You could add. That's yeah, I'm mean. crazy organized in my computer. I've got like like 700 folders. You have to be. Oh, I have to be because I deal with so, so many images. It's so disjointed. I mean, in so many ways, well, all the stuff you're talking is basic marketing 101 that we used to, that we were trained to do on print. Basically, yeah, now it's consistent. Digital. You always want your phone number. Yeah. The only difference is it's just so diffused now, yeah. and it's so overwhelming for people that aren't digitally oriented right now. It's just progressing so fast that you think it's like this new. You know, and it's, oh my God, I don't know what to do. But yeah. really, it's basic 101. It is. And your analytics, all that stuff, is all coming back into line the way we used to study the business. And, and in the olden days. In the olden days, paper and pen. Yeah, paper and pen. Oh my God. <laughs> I don't, it's funny because I don't even know how to write anymore. When I have to use a paper or pen, I'm embarrassed when I have to like go to the bank to make a deposit slip. I'm like, yeah. um, I don't, can you read that? It's like talking <laughs> finger, but it looks like Talak. <laughs> finger and I'm like, all right, whatever. Just get a stamp. Man. Yeah, I used yeah. To like. All right, so analytics. I'm a huge fan of analytics. I feel like you cannot possibly do marketing if you don't know how to understand, at least understand the basics of what analytics and measurements are. Because going by gut feeling, it was okay to go by gut feeling for a while on a lot of different things, but now things like you said are so segmented and disjointed and you're on all these different social networks and you need to keep up and you have to understand your audience and you have to measure. If you don't use analytics, you're going to have a harder time turning an ROI in social networking and YouTube and all this other stuff. And I mean, it's right there. It's so simple. YouTube and Facebook, all these different social networks actually show you what each of these metrics are. There's a lot of times a little question mark and it's a, and you click on it, it tells you exactly what that analytic is measuring. Um, YouTube, for example, you simply go to the analytics profile for a video and you can see everything you ever need to know about this video. Drop off rates, I'm a huge fan, drop off rates is usually the first thing I look at because I want to see how far people watch this video before they dropped off. And like I said, when we're talking about how YouTube ranks videos, Besides the tagging and all these other cool things you do, they take drop-off rates into consideration of whether to propel you up or down. If people are dropping off after 10 or 15 seconds on your video, it doesn't matter what the content is, it doesn't matter how well you tag it, you're not you're gonna get devalued by YouTube. Where do you find them? On each video, there is a little tab there that has its like says analytics. You just click on it, video so analytics. It's on, a particular video. on each individual video has it, and then channel has its own analytics as well as an overall broad. Well, for your for your videos, yeah, your for your you, nobody else can see them. You're the only one who can see your. Well, you're what you got to be locked in. But it measures everything. Drop off rates. It even tells you where in the world people are actually watching, so that you know that are you hitting your target audience. If I'm trying to hit everybody in uh, America, but I see there's a lot of video watches in Uganda and stuff like that. Maybe something's wrong with the way you tag it or something else. Uh, but you know, it gives everything: views, locations. The date range, it even does it by date, you can see exactly. It actually gives you shares, uh, it's not showing up here, but it, it'll actually show you how many times this video was taken from YouTube and shared on Twitter, on Facebook, uh, how many times it was embedded somewhere. It gives you the full story of this video so that you can improve the next video. If you don't have data improve, to improve the next video, a lot of times you really don't understand if that video you just shot before was successful or not. Views is, views, likes, follows, um, pin people who follow you, all these metrics that people look at on a broad scale are almost meaningless because in the end the idea is you want ROI and you can't understand ROI without understanding the metrics behind if you're actually reaching who you need to reach. If you're reaching the people you need to reach and you're still not turning an ROI, then you know at least you're doing this right, there's something else I need to look at to fix. Everything should always end in an ROI measurement. If you're not making money or you're not doing something, um, and making money is not always the end goal. And some businesses obviously aren't going to turn an ROI from social. I know that's weird hearing it from a social media person, but some businesses are never going to get an actual cash ROI on using social media. They use it for brand awareness, or they're using it for initiatives, uh, or they're using it for customer service or long-term relationship building. So, you know, all these different things are all, you can know, figure out all this stuff if you're successful or not through your analytics. And I think that's it. Oh, okay.
Do we have time for this? Actually, no. It's, it's 10 o'clock. But wait, do we have time for this? No. So, uh, quickly. Oh, yes. I love my bloopers. Mm -hmm. I do. Thanks. And I, I almost let the cat out of the bag. I said, I'll take you for it. I started doing this a few months ago, and I absolutely, like, I try to convince everyone to do this. Yeah. I go write two bloopers. <laughs> and it's a drop off if they go to the bloopers. That's right. Yeah, I don't know if that Retention. works. Retention. Yeah. Um, so whenever you're taping, you're no doubt going to screw something up. So this could be something as simple as flubbing a line mm -hmm. to doing something goofy. Mm -hmm. But gets, you know, this is, this is how you take boring business videos and make them worth sharing. Because I could do a video about video marketing that, and my cousin doesn't care anything about video marketing, but he's, he liked what I did at the end. And so he shared it on Facebook. And then his uncle sees it, and maybe he owns a business. So this this is a way of getting, you know, adding the funny element to a boring business video, but in a way that, you know, you don't you're not going to look stupid. You're just going to. It's it almost makes you look more real and more endearing. Mm -hmm. So if you're skeptical, all I'm saying is give it a try. Do you laugh when you make a mistake? It well, makes you know, a I difference swear. if you laugh. Oh, you swear. <laughs> but I don't, I don't be pretend. Pretend. Oh, no wonder the search engines are finding you. Um, all right, so did I cover everything there? Mm -hmm. I thought we were going to see some. Uh, you have to go to his, his uh, you YouTube, go to YouTube, right? YouTube good. slash CT Local Marketing. Mm -hmm. You good? Yeah, Great. we're good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and there's uh, the final slide. Mm -hmm. right. Thanks, guys. Thanks for sitting through it. Went a little over. Very good. Anybody has questions? Obviously, call either one of us. And uh, thank all right. you. Cool. Thanks. Very good.